1941, would you have considered Honolulu your hometown? Yes, I would. And what were your parents' names? Uh, my father's name was Frank Joseph Unger, and my mother was uh, Ottilie uh, Schlemmer Unger. Okay. How many brothers and sisters did you have? Two, two sisters. You were the only son? Yes, and I was the oldest. And you were the oldest of the group. Where did you go to high school? Uh, Roosevelt High School. And uh, a question we have is that, uh, and I think we'll get to that, I think that it'd be premature to ask how you got involved in the military, but I'd, I'd like to ask about what it was like for you to grow up in Honolulu in the 1930s. Well, we were surrounded by sugar cane. About every place you went were waving tassels of cane. <clears throat> and what are today uh, rather large uh, cities were little villages at the time, plantation villages, and I hardly ever had anything to do with them. I was strictly li uh, living in, in Honolulu. Where was the center of town at that time? Uh, where would where would you go for shopping? Where would you go for entertainment? Fort Street. Fort Street. Fort Street, downtown Honolulu, yes. And I, I lived in, <clears throat> well, what, what is even today one of the uh, uh, better uh, residential districts. I live in Makiki, mm -hmm. and one side is, uh, it, it leads right up to Punahou and uh, Manoa Valley, which was where a lot of the the very important people had their residences in the old days. Mm -hmm. Did you live on Makiki Heights or Lower No, Mikiki? I lived on Lower Makiki, actually right across the street from my high school, Roseville High School. Okay. So I was late for school every day. <laughs> Tell me about uh, what it was like to, uh, c to go to high school at Roosevelt. What kind of school was it and, and how many uh, students went to school there? My class had uh, 300 in them. And um, I, I started in the junior high school. I, I started seventh grade at, uh, at uh, Roosevelt High School. And each year as I uh, uh, progressed, uh, they, they cut off one year, and today it's a senior high school. Mm -hmm. The one disting distinguishing feature of Roosevelt High School is the fact that it was an English standard school. The, uh, the people there were uh, the Howleys were getting very, uh, uh, well, they didn't want their children to grow up learning how to speak pidgin. So they uh, decided that there, there was going to be one school that, you, that if you went to this school, you had to speak good English. And um, as a result, we had all Howley teachers from the mainland. Mm -hmm. But uh, <coughs> we, um, it was, uh, to me, uh, uh, an excellent education and, uh, because uh, they, they, they stressed a lot of dramatics and speech, and that's where I, 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 I enjoy that a, a great deal. I was in all the high school plays, and uh, we had a very good football team, and I, I, I loved to play football. We had seven teams at that time, and football was very important. That Honolulu Stadium was like a mecca to, to the Arabs. We, we would go there, and that was a very important part of our lives at Honolulu Stadium. Now, that was later called the Termite Palace, right? They called it the Termite Palace, yes. A lot of famous people actually played ball there, and, and so the high school games, the big high school games were held there? All the high school games were played there, yeah. Now, today when you go to Roosevelt High School, you do see a football field. That didn't exist there in 19... No, we, we, had our own, we had our own football field, right. but we, we didn't... Uh, varsity was big time in those days. If you're high school football, you went to the big place. You went downtown to the stadium. The JVs played on, on the, the, t the, uh, the field at Roosevelt High School. Somewhat like today, all the big games are held now at Aloha Stadium for high school. So yeah. that's the parallel. What was your favorite subject in school? Uh, dramatics. It wasn't, uh, I, I shouldn't say that it, it was my favorite subject, but it was the thing that I, I excelled in. Okay. My, my favorite uh, subject actually was biology. Somewhere along the line, did you get involved in ROTC at Roosevelt? Yes. Can you I tell three, me what the ROTC program was like? I, I had three years of ROTC. <clears throat> it was all very basic. 
we, we would uh, uh, we'd know, know how to care for our, our uh, they called it a piece when I joined the military, but it, it was a rifle in those days. Mm -hmm. we, we, we learned to take care of our rifles. Oh, we marched, we, sal we saluted, it was very basic. Um, I was, um, my senior year, I was captain of uh, Company F in, in the, the ROTC. But uh, quite a few of us we took ROTC, and we all we all liked it. We we liked the program. Do did other high schools have ROTC programs? Uh, Kamehameha uh, had one, that, and McKinley. I I knew those are two that I knew of. But well, Kamehameha was really a military school at one time. Their uniforms were a lot like West Point. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Uh, Leading up to the events of December 7th, um, were you a type of person and did they talk about the impending uh, crisis? I mean, World War II had already started in 1939. Was there ever a concern here in Hawaii that you remember of discussions of the possibility of war in the Pacific? Uh, very little, very little. Did people feel it was just too far away and not something to worry about? Well, not only that, they figured the Japanese were very inferior, that if we ever got in war with them, it would you know, be a piece of cake. But yourself, you had probably friends or, or inter, you had some kind of interaction with Japanese Americans here. Did you think that those opinions or did you think that they, they were somewhat misguided? And what was your relationship with uh, local people here? Oh, the Japanese were just part of us. I mean, they, it was, <laughs> the only thing that they did different, they had to go to Japanese school. Mm -hmm. Language a, school? What's that? Japanese language school? Yeah, Japanese language school. Yeah. And, uh, well, one time there was a German school that the German kids had to go to. So we didn't think too much about that, except that they, they were very well. I'll tell you one thing about the Japanese in, <clears throat> in the old days. They were trusted. When, when, when a, a little kid went into a candy store, uh, the, the proprietor was usually, usually Chinese. The Chinese owned all the small stores. Uh, they, they never bothered about the kid ever robbing them or anything. There was a, a great deal of pride in, in the Japanese community, and there's a lot of discipline. And another thing with it, they, there was uh, very little intermarriage. The old folks, the old Japanese, they didn't want this intermarriage stuff either. But uh, the Japanese were uh, <clears throat> uh, very well trusted. Their, their children were very well disciplined. Mm -hmm. Well, did you, I guess, um, let me just rephrase this question. At that time, was it unusual for a, a, a high school senior to have a car? Uh, today, cars for teenagers are, you know, they kind of, it's kind of uh, almost a necessity for some was that rare in your day? Uh, it was rather rare, yeah. I did have a car, and the only reason I got it was my folks were going to the mainland, uh, and I was, I was home with, uh, with the girls, and I just had to have some way to go shopping. Do you remember the car, what it was? Oh, oh yeah, it was a Model A Roadster. Had a rumble seat in the back, in the back, a rumble seat that would open up. Was that at like a 29 or a 32? Oh, it was probably a, yeah, 29 or 30. Mm-hmm. Around you, not only were sugarcane fields, but military bases, were you aware of the presence of the military here in the Pacific Fleet? Was that something that, as an ROTC person, you were interested in seeing, and did you have any interaction with them at all? Uh, not really. Well, actually, I was a, I was a Navy brat. My, my dad was, was uh, stationed on the R-14, a submarine, when I was born. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, Pearl Harbor was part of our, part of our life. Uh, he used to take me uh, aboard uh, the subs every now and then. And I kind of dreaded it because we had to walk on a little narrow gangplank. Right. And I was just a little toddler, and I looked down at that awful blue water, and I, I just didn't like this at all. But anyhow, there was usually a bowl of ice cream at the other end for me, so that was okay. Yeah. Did you remember looking at the battleships and that kind of, I mean, there was all this majesty of ships, so. Uh, it was all part of my life. Uh -huh. I just took it for granted because that, we'd, go do, we'd go down there to the commissary. See, right. We'd get gas. That was like our second, second home down there in Pearl Harbor. 
1941, you were still in school? No, I was six months out of high school. What were you doing? I was driving a truck for the Standard Oil Company, and it wasn't that I was a good truck driver, it was because I was a good football player. The, owner, <laughs> the owners of the, uh, of the company, well, the, the company that had the contract for actually uh, dredging K Lagoon was uh, George Clark and a fellow by the name of Ching. And they decided to start up a football team, and they needed players. So uh, they were not only uh, dredging a canal, and they needed work for, uh, not a canal, but uh, a seaplane base. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they, uh, they decided, well, they could give you a job uh, if you play football, and so that's how I got the job. So I, I played, and we had some pretty good play. We, I played against Jackie Robinson, who came down here from uh, uh, UCLA. Really? Mm -hmm. What kind Jack, of player was he? He, he, was, uh, uh, he was an uh, All-American. Actually, he lettered in, in four sports at uh, UCLA. But Quite an athlete. Yeah, he, he certainly was. Uh, well, that, that's, that's the caliber of guys I was playing against. And of course, I was I was able to carry the ball pretty well. But on defense, I'm my man. They they really beat me. I was only 18 years old. I was the youngest guy in, in the league. Mm. But um, I I enjoyed it. And anyhow, that's what I was. Uh, that's how I was employed. And uh, when when the attack uh, occurred, I was actually employed by. Uh, Standard Dredging Company. They brought over the largest dredge, the, the, the largest hydraulic dredge in the world, the Jefferson, they brought over for this project. Wow. Let's go to the events of December 7th. Uh, the night before the attack, December 6th, do you remember that night, oh, that day, and what did you did? I remember that night very well. Our football season was over, and uh, uh, George Clark, um, he, he was, he was uh, formerly the uh, captain of the uh, uh, University of Hawaii football team, a black belt judo guy. But anyhow, he uh, he threw a luau for for the for the team, and everybody who was in had anything to do with football was there that night, including Neil Blaisdell, who was the uh, he was the, uh, the football coach for Roosevelt High School when Roosevelt took the championship in 1936. I was his water boy, so actually I, I worked out from water boy to first string fullback at Roosevelt <laughs> High School. Anyhow, that night, uh, uh, yes, we had a big luau, and I had too much to drink. Where and was I, that held at? At McKinley High School. Uh, it was uh, uh, behind uh, M McKinley High School. They had a very large uh, piece of property there, and they had a big tent. And uh, so anyhow, I, uh, I went home that night uh, feeling no pain. And, and, uh, but, but it was not unusual because uh, the weekends was really party time always with, with the military over there and even the civilians out of the nice hotels around Waikiki. Party time. So on the morning of December 7th, you're fast asleep at home? Um, I got up feeling pretty bad. But anyhow, you had a hangover. I, I sure did. <laughs> so I went down the hall. Uh, it was a bright, sunny day. My dad had just bought a great big radio console, uh, a beautiful piece of furniture, but the radio wouldn't work. And as a matter of fact, the sales the salesman had had, had sold him the, this piece of furniture, and well, it was a combination of uh, a radio and you can play records on it and so forth. He was there to demonstrate it to my dad. We turned on the radio and, and it wouldn't work. There was nothing on the air. So all of a sudden the radio did crack on and there was Webley Edwards. Ladies and gentlemen, stay off the highway. Oahu was under an enemy attack. The sign of the rising sun has been spotted on the wingtips. Radio silence. The military had ordered the radio stations off the air, too late, of course, because the Japanese were following the, the, the radio beam in to bomb Oahu. So I ran, out and I ran out in the front yard with my sister, and we could see Punchbowl. Punchbowl was nothing but a bunch of kiawe trees and cactus at that time. Today it is a national cemetery, as we all know. Over the top of Punchbowl was 
was a, a black canopy of uh, anti-aircraft fire. And out of that anti-aircraft fire, there came a, a Japanese aircraft like a scalded cat right over our heads. The plane banked, and these two helmeted gog goggle figures looked down at my sister and I. We looked at them, and they were gone. Mm. So I ran back into the house, listened to the radio for a while. And the radio announcer came back on, and they were asking for uh, motorcycle couriers and truck drivers to report to the palace grounds. So I got in my Model A, jumping the curbs as I went home, Honolulu, which is like a deserted town. There was nobody around until I got to the palace grounds. There were hundreds of people milling around. Mm -hmm. So the Red Cross was set up. I grabbed a, uh, an armband. I, I put it on my put on my arm, and I jumped on the tail uh, tail of the uh, Lures and Cook uh, lumber truck, and we headed down Kamehameha Avenue right towards Pearl Harbor. Do you remember about what time this was? Oh, it was probably uh, around 8:30. So the raid is still going on. Yeah, went on for I don't know 90 minutes or mm -hmm. longer than that, I guess. <laughs> And we could see Pearl Harbor as we went, as we headed down uh, uh, Kamehameha Avenue. We could see Pearl Harbor. Uh, the smoke was just billowing out of Pearl Harbor, but there was a military police in the middle of the road at Hickam Air Force Base, and he directed us to go on in. So we went into Hickam Air Force Base. The first thing I remember jumping off the truck was I I, I stumbled over a fire hose, and it was this fire engine was all burned up. So anyhow, we went in. As, as we went in, somebody said, go, on, go down to the guardhouse. There's somebody down there. So we were able to save one, an, one man out of the, out of the bombed-out guardhouse. I then joined the bucket brigade carrying water so the doctors could operate. And one of the doctors came out. He looked like he had been in a, in a, a slaughterhouse. His, his apron was dripping with blood. And he said, would you mind taking some of these bodies out of here? And we said, yeah, we would. So we, we loaded nine bodies on our truck and we took them to a Tripler Army Hospital. And uh, then that night, well, I didn't know what to do. I, I, I went back to the palace grounds and I slept under our truck. And I got up the next, I was always afraid of getting strafed. Um, I came very close to it later on in the war, but anyhow, <laughs> um, I slept under our truck. And when I got up the next morning, while I was wandering around town, I came across some of my high school friends with which whom I had had ROTC training with. They were carrying rifles. So I went down to the armory, got a rifle, khaki uniform, and an armband, and we were organized into the uh, Hawaii Territorial Guard. I never exactly knew why we were organized uh, other than to prevent and, or, or get ready for an invasion. But I found out later on the military was hung up on sabotage. We were to prevent sabotage. So I was down to Evil A for a while, guarding the, the, the gas tanks, then I went out to the tuna packers for a while. One day, a military truck came by, had a great big strapping guy remind me of sort of a bulldog. He was a big man. His name was uh, Captain Eifler. He was German. And um, uh, he said, uh, I want you and you and you. He was a reserve captain. I found out later on he was head of the customs service here in, in Honolulu. So he picked out about three or four of us out of the squad as they get on the truck. So, okay, we got on the truck. We weren't about to argue with this guy. We went to Honolulu Harbor. We went across the harbor and along to Sand Island. When I got out to Sand Island, they were stringing barbed wire. That's where I joined the military. It became the 811th Military Police Company, and there on Sand Island, we established the first prisoner of war camp on American soil since 1861. America's first prisoner of war was Ensign Sakamaki off of a two-man submarine. Did you see him? Oh, yes. They brought him into our orderly, orderly room. A little guy had a white T-shirt, white shorts on, a little small guy, shaved head, you know, typical. Could never pick him out in a crowd. Typical little Japanese fella. Uh, yeah, we had him for, for a while. Um, and uh, then um, uh, well, enemy aliens were rounded up. We had uh, uh, um, Italians, Germans, Austrians, and later on, um, Marine, um, Korean Marines were brought in from uh, Jimmy Roosevelt's raid on Macon Island. 
I was entrusted with those guys for, there were nine of them, but anyhow, that was later on, later on. Among the Austrians was Alfred Price, the famous, later be famous architect, right? That's right, Alfred Price uh, was there, and it was Alfred Price who designed the Arizona Memorial. Wow. Yeah. He stayed on and uh, I apparently was quite successful as an architect here in the military. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that seems like a lot of responsibility to be thrown on an 18-year-old. Were you 18 at the time or 19? Yeah, I was 18. Yeah. I mean, you're guarding prisoners, you're guarding yeah. facilities. Let me Did tell you an tell you, uh, interesting thing. Uh, uh, we had, uh, I don't know why, well, one, one reason, uh, uh, I, I had a, a unique position there because I, I had just, I, I was an athlete. Right. And... Um, Fairly well-known one. Uh, f uh, fairly well, well, being a, you know, I was the youngest guy to come right out of high school and play right over there. Yeah, I was fairly well known. I never was a great star, but everybody knew me. Uh, I took over the job of, believe it or not, uh, was a drill sergeant. I was a corporal at the time. They gave me stripes right away as a corporal. <clears throat> but what was interesting about this, the people they were bringing in, uh, the Red Cross, and the Swiss uh, were constantly uh, inspecting our camp. And we had National Guard boys down there that sometimes they were not too well behaved. Uh, so they, 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 they didn't get rid of all of them, but some of the troublemakers, they got rid of it. And they brought in boys from the mainland. They brought in some very, very top guys. Uh, there was Eddie Brett, who was a chemical engineer. There's a guy by the name of, uh, I forget his name right now, but anyhow, he was a rower uh, on the uh, SC uh, rowing. Uh, he was on the crew for rowing on, on SC. But the, the one guy was a local boy. His name was uh, uh, Vince Esposito. Now, Vince Esposito graduated first in his law, law class from uh, Harvard University presented the Palm Prize by Frankfurt, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and he was a private. Now, all of these guys are out there. In fact, the manager of Cow Cow Corner was there. That was a big drive in, the only drive in, the Cow Cow Corner. Vern Halliger, he was out there. But none of these guys were in real great shape. Well, I was in great shape. So I gave them rifle calisthenics. I would run them around the island. <laughs> and I was, uh, uh, I was like training these guys. And these guys were, I was just out of high school. These guys are college people, right. very uh, highly educated guys. But the one big job I had kind of worried me a little bit when they brought in these Koreans, the Korean Marines, you were at that time, you know, the Japanese had invaded Korea and they were using their guys in the Japanese Armed Forces. Uh, um, our CO Eiffler said, take these guys uh, out, have them dig a hole and fill it up, level off the drill field, do something with them. So I had a shotgun, that's all I had. So, okay, we went out. And uh, these guys were digging holes for a while and now all of a sudden they would lay down their tools and they'd sit down. So I said, I don't know what's going on around here, but maybe I just got a sit-down strike on me. So I just wait a little while. A few minutes later, they get up again, they go to work again. That's how they work. They work very hard for five minutes, and they rest for five minutes. Okay, so then the work is over, and on the way out one day, this guy was practicing his English on me. He says, you're very handsome. <laughs> I, said to him, I said, okay, but you know, I think a flattery will get you nowhere. <laughs> yeah. So, these, uh, these uh, Korean Marines are there. They're kind of like a, a, a conscript troops, right? I mean, they yeah. conscripted in. What, what was the, you know, people talk about this camp, and there's very little really written about it. W was it a place of tension, or was it because there was Japanese Americans that had been rounded up? as part of the infrastructure of the Japanese community. There were uh, aliens there like Alfred Price that had nothing to do with Austria. They had actually fled Austria. There was a mixture of that. What was the, the atmosphere at that camp? It was very quiet. There no problems. No, there was no problem. Except no for the problem. troublemakers, right? 
Uh, you kind of mentioned them. You didn't mention why they were troublemakers. Well, they didn't like their sergeant, uh, and uh, they, uh, they they plotted against him one night, and uh, and it went something like this: um, we we had an electric fence all the way all the way around, and we had guard towers all the way around, and we had about eight or nine guard posts outside. Well, uh, guard post number one would fire his shotgun into the air and he'd go, Sergeant of the Guard, post number six, so that he'd get on his bicycle, go try, you just get out there. Sergeant of the Guard, post number two. So they had this guy going crazy when I just running back and forth. That's the kind of stuff they were pulling on him. If I was to take you out to Sand Island, could we find this place where the camp was? No, I've been out there. I don't know where it is. 